My name is Tino Cuellar, and I'm a faculty member here at Stanford Law School. On behalf of Stanford Law School, I uh, extend my welcome to this remarkable gathering, including uh, representatives of the four major U.S. patent institutions. I must say this is a little bit like the U.N. Security Council of U.S. Patent Law. It is an honor for us to have so many of you here, including PTO Director David Kapos, Federal Circuit Judge Kathleen O'Malley, ITC Commissioner Shara Aronoff, and uh, Federal Judicial Center Director Jeremy Fogel. More on Judge Fogel in a moment. Now, my primary field is administrative law and not intellectual property. Uh, so you may be wondering what I'm doing up here. But on most days, there is little doubt in my mind that administrative law, with its obsession on uh, with uh, issues like deference and delegation and estoppel is eventually poised to take over the entire legal system. And if the last panel is any indication, we're well on our way. My wife, however, whose background is in IP litigation, disagrees. So in the interest of familial harmony, I do want to acknowledge the enormous importance of intellectual property and patent law to Stanford, to this extraordinary region known as Silicon Valley, and to the larger world. Whether one is trying to find a solution for treating neglected tropical diseases in Africa, or trying to chart the future of consumer technologies, what you're talking about today matters profoundly for the world. The current director of the Federal Judicial Center understands this as well as anyone. My wife and I have had the pleasure of getting to know Judge Fogel and his wife over the last few years. Among other things, he and I share an interest in law and psychology, a subject we were lucky to have him teach here at Stanford on many occasions. So it's my distinct honor now to introduce Judge Fogel. Judge Fogel served on the state court bench, as many of you know, for nearly two decades. In 1998, he was confirmed to the U.S. District Court right here in the Northern District of California. He quickly established himself as a skilled patent jurist. He brings to his work at the Federal Judicial Center not only this long experience, but also his intellectual curiosity and his deep commitment to the rule of law. Instead of going on like this for another 20 or 30 minutes, I thought I'd make this simple and read some lines from an important document I've obtained, the original job vacancy announcement from the Federal Judicial Center describing the characteristics they most sought in a new director. Ideally, the document reads, the successful candidate will have all or most of the following characteristics. Counterculture experience, preferably involving long hair. We prefer a Renaissance person as demonstrated, for example, by an undergraduate degree in religion championship bowler or the equivalent advanced degree. The committee will also look favorably upon jazz piano playing skills, must enjoy spicy food and potato chips, connections to Stanford Law School a significant plus. You can see clearly that the position of director of the Federal Judicial Center was made for Judge Fogel. And if you get to know him, you can see some other things. You can see that he has lived the law with courage, integrity, and energy. You can see that he remains humble and down to earth despite all he has accomplished. Judge Fogel was educated here at Stanford, and let me just say that if the law school were a venture capital fund and Judge Fogel were a company that Stanford had invested in, we'd be approaching Facebook territory right now. Welcome, Judge. Well, Tino, thank you very much. Um, it's, um, I've been, been sitting here all uh, day just being amazed at what a great program uh, this has been and, and just the uh, uh, enormous skill and knowledge of the people who presented. It's, it's a unique occasion. I've been to a lot of uh, patent programs uh, and I think this one just from wall to wall really has been one of the, the most stimulating I've been to and I think one of the things that has made it that way has been the, the, the cross fertilization, the different perspectives and I think that's really a, a tribute to uh, Peter Minnell and Mark Lemley for conceiving of this and setting it up the way they did. And, and also the, uh, the terrific speakers that they've, they've uh, brought together. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Federal Judicial Center, I just want to take 30 seconds. Um, we are charged by statute by, under federal law for, with doing uh, the uh, training uh, and education of uh, not only federal judges, but all of the folks who work in the federal judiciary. So that includes uh, clerks and probation officers and. Uh, court attorneys, but we, we obviously uh, spend a lot of our time uh, educating judges. Um, and we also, uh, I think, uniquely do um, research on judicial administration. We do that uh, in the same uh, shop, although we have different people doing it. And we get a lot of um, cross-fertilization from that. We, uh, the patent pilot program, which you've heard mentioned a couple times today and which I will come back to, um, actually is a project of our research division. Uh, they are studying whether uh, having this type of very modest specialization 
uh, in the patent area actually improves judicial administration. Uh, so that's, uh, it seems counterintuitive in some ways, but we're actually primarily charged with doing that research rather than providing the training. But we're also taking a very active role in coordinating the training. Um, I want to start just by talking about um, where we come from as judges. Uh, you know, a lot of the countries, Germany uh, being one of them, was uh, talked about before, and a lot of other countries in the world have career judiciaries. So people are identified as uh, prospective judges early in their uh, legal careers, and they uh, get trained extensively. They get months and months and months of training, and they get a lot of uh, ongoing training at being judges. Um, we don't have a system like that. Um, our judges are chosen from the bar. Um, some of them have been litigators, some of them have been academics, some of them have done, done other things, but they're all lawyers, and they've all been trained in the common law system, in the American legal system, uh, the same type of system that exists uh, in most of the English-speaking world and a few other places. And what lawyers are taught to do from, from really the beginning of law school throughout uh, our careers is, is some very specific things. We're taught to find facts, uh, now, we don't learn a lot about cognition or psychology or any of the things that I've spent years being interested in, but we're taught to be fact finders, to look at a, at a set of facts and to, and to make decisions as to what the facts of a particular case are if there are factual disputes. We're taught to identify legal issues and see where, what facts give rise to what legal issues, and then we're taught to apply the applicable law to those facts. So that's what lawyers are taught to do, and that's what judges are taught to do. Um, in the um, original formulation of that, the expectation was that if you were a judge, that you would apply those skills in uh, jury trials, right? You would, you would be the presider over a system in which uh, people would try to resolve matters, and if they couldn't resolve them, then a jury would make a decision. And the judge's role, and this is pretty current, our, our Chief Justice uh, uh, use these words at his uh, confirmation hearing, was to call balls and strikes. You're the neutral um, arbiter of the uh, procedure or the game, if you will, by which the facts are presented to the fact finder, the, the jury. And you, your job as the judge in a jury trial is to make sure that the correct legal rulings are made and the correct instructions are given uh, to the jury. And then the jury decides what the facts are. And you really don't need a lot of subject matter expertise. The only thing you need to be an expert at is the law. So this is the traditional uh, picture of judges. You know, you, you learn these legal reasoning skills, and you learn to be a neutral arbiter, and you really are the master of process and not of, and not of substance. Well, uh, you know, something went a little bit awry uh, not too long ago, but certainly in the last 30, 40 years, there's been a trend away from jury trials uh, toward uh, cases resolving uh, in other ways. I think uh, you can look at lots of different statistics, but the numbers are somewhere between 2 and 4 percent of, of civil filings result in cases going to, to jury trial. And so judges necessarily have had to re, uh, develop a second set of skills, and those skills involve uh, case management. And the sort of the, the, the simple, um, basic uh, formulation of case management is you, you set deadlines, you establish schedules, you decide motions, uh, you resolve disputes over discovery. In other words, you simply uh, help prune and shape the case as it moves its way through the process toward trial, and uh, eventually uh, cases go away. Uh, that's, that's the experience of, of case management that, that probably generically judges in our system uh, learn. Now, judges are very different among themselves in terms of how they manage cases. Uh, you have people who are very active case managers. You have people who are very passive case managers. You have people who really focus on settlement. You have other people who focus on getting motions decided. You, there's as many different styles as there are judges, but the point is case management has become a part of the, uh, the, the daily bread of, of, of judges in our, in our system. And finally, the other thing that judges learn generically is you learn to have expectations about uh, people, right? Because you're presiding over cases involving people. You've got parties, you've got, you've got lawyers, uh, you've got dynamics between them. And there's just volumes and volumes and volumes of folk wisdom out there about how, how cases are presented and how cases are disposed of. You know, and you can talk to any judge who's been around for very long, and they'll tell you their folk wisdom. They'll be very happy to say, oh, you just need to set a firm trial date, you know, and then the, the case will go away. Or, 
Or, you know, you, you just have to bring them in a room and make them sit there until they settle, you know, and if they both walk out angry, then you've got a good settlement. I mean, you hear, you hear things like that from judges, you know, and it's, it's just the folk wisdom that people uh, acquire uh, over trying to manage cases and do this job. So that's kind of the general picture, right? Now, patent litigation. Patent litigation is it's a form of civil litigation. And so, uh, in many ways, the rules are the same, and in many ways, the, the, the structure in which we're operating is the same. But I would like to say, in this brief time I have this afternoon, that I think there are some very fundamental ways in which patent litigation is different. And if we're going to uh, deal with um, the problems and the challenges that are presented, uh, the ones we've been talking about today, uh, we need to recognize some of these differences, because it is and I think any judge who's done a lot of patent cases could tell you it is different from most of the other work uh, we've done. Uh, to pick one really obvious one, uh, patent cases have their own nomenclature. They have their own language. There is, there is a whole way of talking, you know, speaking patent. You know, that, that, that is, if you were just walking down the street, if you go out here on campus or you go, go out on El Camino and you start talking about fazitas, you know, people are going to think you're, you're talking about, you know, something you can get at a restaurant. You know, it's just, it's not, it's, it's, it's just not language that people cotton to. You know, we're just some of the really quaint things we use, obvious and over, o obviousness over prior art, or improperly importing limitations from the specification, or claims that read on accused devices. I mean, there are all ways of, of speaking that are, are just generic to, to patent lawyers and patent litigation, but are, are different. And so you have a generalist judge, somebody who's maybe uh, coming out of a U.S. attorney's office, or they've been trying personal injury cases, or they have been working at a university teaching administrative law, you know, and, and they, they walk in and all of a sudden there's all of this language getting thrown around. And then you find out that um, little words, I was, I was just fascinated this morning when we were talking about claim clarity. So uh, somebody define for me what a uh means. <laughs> the, or the, why putting the semicolon here and not there changes the entire meaning of the entire patent. I mean, someone explain that to me. And yet that's what we get. You know, you walk in and there's teams of lawyers who are just extremely skilled and they're telling you this is the most important case you've ever heard and the placement of that comma is absolutely the most important decision you'll ever have to make. You know, that's, that's not something that judges are necessarily uh, prepared for. I'll come back to that in a minute, too. Um, so another thing that patent cases are really different. Uh, patent cases or patents don't just kind of <coughs> fall from the sky, right? And patents result from an administrative process. And it's really a very, very robust administrative process. Uh, we've, we've been mentioned several times today about taking the patent pilot judges to the, uh, the, the PTO. And I think it was a real eye-opener for them. And these are judges who like patent cases. These are people who have volunteered to do patent cases in a, in a more intensive way. And, you know, they just, you go and you can't help noticing, hey, this is a serious place. You know, this isn't, and I don't mean to demean anybody by saying this, but this is not the post office. You know, this is not, this is not GSA. I mean, these are, these are, these are places where You've got people with, with serious backgrounds in law and in, in technology, and, and, and they're, they're, they're taking their job seriously. And, and, and no, nothing comes out of there that hasn't been very, very carefully vetted. It doesn't mean they always get it right. It doesn't mean there aren't some examiners that are better or worse than others. But, but it's a serious process. And I think that's a foreign process to a lot of judges. Um, a real important way that patent law is different is that to understand what the case is about, you have to have some idea what the technology is. I mean, you don't have to be an expert. You can't be an expert. But you can't just say, well, well this is just like um, trying to decide whether the property line is in the right place or not. You know, the kinds of factual determinations that have to get made in patent cases sometimes are very, very esoteric. Uh, I think one, one of the cases I remember, and it's not a good memory, is a, uh, it, it was a, a case involving chip design. And uh, we get a lot of those in Silicon Valley, so I actually ended up having quite a number of those cases. But I think the first one I had that was really kind of a high-level logic case, I mean, I literally got a migraine. You know, <laughs> and I was trying really hard. And we, had, we had a Markman hearing that went a day and a half, and I, and I just kept asking the expert, I don't get it. Just keep, I keep, 
try, explain it to me, please. I still don't get it. I'm not sure I ever did get it. <laughs> and fortunately, the case settled before I had to write the, the Markman order. But you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really hard. And, and I think judges aren't used to that, right? I mean, you're a federal judge, right? You, you, you've, been, you've been a successful person in your career, and you've, you've always gotten a lot of acclaim for what you did. You were probably a pretty good student, you know? And, 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 and then you end up having to deal with something that you just don't understand. Or you think you understand, but you don't. That's even worse. You know, and, and, and that's not at all unusual in patent cases. I mean, it's, there's some patents that are easier than others. I used to always rate them on a scale of 1 to 10, and I would even ask the lawyers at, at the case management conferences, I would say, where is this on a scale of 1 to 10? And if they said, oh, judge, it's about a 6, you know, then I would kind of factor up a couple, you know, that for me it's probably an 8. But when they said it was a 9, you know, I really get scared. You know, I mean, it was, that is going to be a, a real, real tough thing to do. And, and one of the things that that encourages is, is you rely a lot more on counsel and you rely a lot more on experts than you might ordinarily. And I can't think of any area other than patent law, maybe, maybe medical malpractice, but we don't see a lot of that in federal court, where, where, where you don't, where, where you rely so much on other people. You know, it's not like you're abdicating your role as a, a decision maker, but in order to make a decision, you have to depend so much on, on other people. Um, there's significant evidence, you know, when the cases get to juries and the juries have to make uh, the fact findings to decide cases. Uh, I don't know how all of you all feel who have litigated, but certainly my perspective as a judge is the jurors do not decide the case based on the science. And they probably don't really decide the case based on the instructions either. You know, I'm not disparaging the jury system, I'm just trying to be honest. I mean, I think, I think they make the case decision based on something else. It's kind of a morality play in kind of deciding who the, the good guys and the bad guys are and, you know, who, who was in the right and who was in the wrong, because I think that's the way lay people tend to think about things in general. And I think when the technology gets too hard and too complex, it's, 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 it's an easy temptation to fall back on that and to say, I, I, I kind of have a better feeling about that party than I do about this one. Uh, one, of the, one of my cases, and it's long over and there was a published decision in it, was one where the jury was uh, given uh, some inquiries about obviousness and I submitted a special verdict form with the, with the factors to the, uh, to the jury and there was sort of a prefatory question, uh, is X um, prior art that's relevant to the, to the patent? And then there was a bunch of other questions that went to the, 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 the factors. And the, the obvious, I mean, it had been conceded by the plaintiff that it was relevant prior art. The question was just whether, whether it was something that that uh, rendered the patent obvious, and the jury said, no, it's not relevant prior art. They just really didn't like the defendant, you know, so they answered all of the questions adverse to the defendant, including that one, and that it was very illuminating, and I, I listened later to the argument at the Federal Circuit, and the, the, the panel said, well, that kind of tells you something about the jury verdict, doesn't it, you know, that, that it was sort of an obvious question. And so I think that just tells us how much this is different in the sense that we really have to deal with scientific complexity in a way that we don't anywhere else. Uh, Judge Posner just uh, gave a speech at the Seventh Circuit Conference where I happened to be, uh, and uh, he was making that very point, that we, we don't uh, give enough help to judges in, in, in just being able to grasp some of these technological uh, issues that are presented to us. All right, another way that the patent uh, system is different is that the law is judge-made. I mean, we got our first significant revision of the patent laws in over half a century with, with the AIA. But there's a lot of stuff the AIA, AIA didn't even deal with. You know, and a lot of the law that we have to apply as district judges is judge-made law, and it's, it's law that's evolving. It, it can change this week. You know, there'll be a new decision out from the Federal Circuit or a new decision out from the Supreme Court, and all of the assumptions that we've been operating under uh, suddenly shift. Uh, so uh, we have to keep up with it. Um, and then, as, as others have mentioned, there is the, um, there, there are the fictions. There are the, this, the panel we had, a, a, one before the last one, was talking about deference and, and, and the problems with deference. Well, you know, we have a whole set of situations in the patent uh, litigation world where we are asked to make decisions as a matter of law which require fact-finding. It's not just Markman, but it's, it's, uh, it's uh, anything that would lead to a finding of invalidity, clear and convincing type of evidence that you have to have in order to make this finding of, or this conclusion of law about something being invalid. And we have to kind of work our way through those 
uh, conundrums as well, that we're, we're making legal determinations but that require fact-finding, which is kind of mind-boggling when you think about it. And then finally, just in that same vein, uh, we have a system in which the, the trial judges, the people who are making the initial decisions, are uh, generalists and don't have any special training and have law clerks that do everything for them. And then the reviewing court, the Federal Circuit, uh, although it certainly does not have an exclusive patent jurisdiction, they do have a national patent jurisdiction and they um, um, have law clerks, well, I think as far as I know all of the judges have law clerks with, with it, at least some of the law clerks have technical backgrounds. And so you have a more uh, specialized uh, appellate court than you have uh, a trial court. Um, jury trials. Uh, well, as I said, there are not a lot of them in the, in the district courts as it is. There are even fewer when you talk about patent cases. There are a couple of notable exceptions, Eastern Texas and, and Delaware and New Jersey. But we uh, had, when we had the patent pilot judges together uh, last week, one of the questions we asked them was, how many jury trials have you done? And, and most, of the, um, most of the judges there, majority of the judges who are patent pilot judges have been federal judges for more than 10 years, which, which is good. I mean, it's, you've got a very experienced group. Uh, the average uh, of number of jury, patent jury trials was fewer than five. So you've got judges who've been federal judges for, for 10 years or more who've had fewer than five uh, patent jury trials. So there was uh, Ju Judge Davis from the Eastern District of Texas, couldn't, couldn't count how many jury trials he had, but, but he, was, uh, he was the exception. Um, so, uh, you know, that's a significant fact when, when, when the system is oriented around jury trials. I would say that, and this is speaking from the perspective of, of 30 years as a judge, both state and federal, uh, the, the litigation culture in patent cases is unique. You know, there, are, there are big cases. There's no question that there are big cases in other areas, but there's nothing like a patent case. I mean, you know, I cannot think of any cases where we have a status conference, and this is the, the initial Rule 16 conference where you're just kind of finding out what the case is about, who the parties are, and has everybody been served with process and that kind of stuff. And, and, and six lawyers per side show up, you know, where it takes longer for people to state appearances than it does to do the status conference, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, that is unique to patent cases. Um, the um, cost of discovery, and we've heard the $5 million figure, and I, I've heard it suggested that that's even a, a low number in, in, a, in a really heavily litigated case. Um, the, the lawyers, I, I honestly can say, and I'm not just speaking to this audience, I mean, they're, they're the best. I mean, they're just tremendously skilled uh, capable lawyers, and then you add to that skill level a, uh, a presumption most of the time that you cannot leave any stones unturned. You have to raise every issue. You can't miss anything because these are bet the company cases, and if you miss something, you know, the, the cost to your client is just going to be uh, enormous. And so, so everything gets litigated, everything gets argued about. And, you know, one of the, I, I, mean, I love electronic filing, I think electronic filing is great. But one of the things electronic filing does is that at 3 o'clock on Sunday morning, you have somebody's sir, sir, reply brief, you know, uh, <laughs> flowing in here, you know. And that's, that's, that's not unusual in patent litigation. It's, it's, it's actually quite common. And finally, this, this last panel that we had, uh, the, the economics of, 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 of the patent world, I thought that was just a fascinating panel. I've been trying to get my arms around this now for, for several years, and it took me probably the first 10 years on the bench to figure out what patent cases were about. And once I got that figured out, then I was more interested in you know, what's really going on underneath the surface. What's, what's the game within the game? You know, what's, what's actually taking place? This is, this is a, a, just a fascinating window into that uh, because you know, whatever is happening in court and whatever is being presented to us in court, I know that there's a whole other thing going on back in the, back in the, in the, in the, in the counsel's office or in the in the boardrooms or wherever the decisions are getting made. And, and what those decisions are and what the dynamics of those decisions are depends so much on who the parties actually are. You know, we have this, this sort of uh, naive stereotype of, a, of, a, of an inventor working in the garage who invents something and then the big bad infringer steals their, their idea and, you know, and the, that's the morality play, but that's not who appears in court in, in major patent litigation. Those people are nowhere to be found. You know, and I'm not making any judgments about who's good, bad, or, or ugly. I'm just saying that, that the, the high stakes nature of it all kind of, the, the, the postures that are presented in court do not reflect what's actually going on in the decision-making process of the parties. And as a, as a mediator, 
Uh, I'm fascinated by that. Um, I, one of the more fruitful experiences I ever had was uh, maybe eight, ten years ago, I had a biotech case where the parties agreed to let me mediate. And we spent probably four or five days getting the case settled. We did get it settled. And we stopped talking about the law about halfway through the first day. And, and after that, it was all business. And it was just, it was fascinating. I mean, the, the, once everybody realized it was okay to stop posturing, let's just figure out if we can solve this business problem. I mean, then it was, there was different kind of posturing, but it was, it was, uh, it was, it was fascinating. I think what the education problem is for us at the FJC and for anybody who wants to see um, better quality of judging in patent cases is to recognize that all these points I've made, and these aren't just things that are um, beyond the general expertise of most judges, they're really outside the comfort zone of a lot of judges. And that's an important thing. I mean, people don't go to law school so that they can get into advanced economics, right? People don't go to law school so that they can understand uh, DNA or understand uh, a drug composition or something like that. They go to law school because they like the law and they, they have the, sort of the, the, the public service desires that come with that. And yet to do these cases competently, you have to at least understand something about science, you have to understand something about economics, you have to understand something about market behavior, and, and you have to understand something about administrative law and the interplay between administrative uh, decision making and judicial decision making. Um, so that's kind of an overview. Um, I think I have a, just a couple ideas that I'll close with about how we can begin to address that. And I think over the last uh, five days, I've seen two uh, really stellar examples of what I think we need to do. Um, last Wednesday, when we had the, the patent pilot judges in uh, Washington, D.C., we went to Alexandria and visited the PTO. That was, that was great. I think that was the first time for most of us that we'd ever been there, uh, that we'd ever really gotten a chance to see what's going on there and, and what those people are doing, get a sense of what the vision of the, of the folks at the PTO is. I think that's, that's just the beginning. There's a whole follow-up that needs to be done to that, but it's an insight into get how we can get judges more attuned to that particular uh, piece of the, of the puzzle. I think this meeting today is, is a terrific example of what we need to do, getting uh, people exposed to different perspectives, uh, to, to seeing different pieces of the problem, to realize it isn't just a legal problem, it isn't just an economic problem, it isn't just a, uh, a scientific problem. Uh, we need to find ways to get a lot of that cross-fertilization happening, and, and not just for judges, but, but for everybody else in the, in the system as well. And I think the last point I would make is that um, it's going to be a slow and incremental process. There's really a lot to learn. There's, this, is, this is not easy stuff for any of us, really, to, to understand each other's worlds and understand each other's point of view. But I think it's really essential that we do that. And, and the reason that I think it's essential that we do that is that it's, the one thing I think everybody who's spoken today agrees on is how important technological innovation is. You know, I've, I've, I've seen the, the, the comment made, uh, I mean, I know Tom Friedman's written about it, but I know other people have as well. And the thing that really distinguishes the United States uh, in the world economy is, is our tremendous capacity for innovation uh, and, and, and technological uh, innovation. Uh, we can't compete in pricing. We can't compete in labor costs. There's a whole lot of ways we cannot compete with other, par other parts of the world. But an area that we're really out in front and, and very strong is, is in innovation. And our patent system has to uh, support that enough. We, we can't have the friction. We can't have the, the inertia or the, or the dysfunctional uh, aspects of our system to get in the way of that because that's really the core of what, what makes our economy uh, as strong as it can be. And, and so the, the importance of the work uh, and educating each other and becoming more attuned to each other's concerns and, and figuring out ways we can make the system more efficient. For instance, getting a better understanding of when you stay a case and when you don't and what's going to happen when you, when you do and when you don't and just, just getting a more sophisticated understanding of those dynamics. I think it's well worth it. Uh, and uh, I just think it's, uh, it's great that we've taken the steps that we have. So thank you. <clears throat>